Good evening and welcome to our sixth midweek Lenten service. God's relationship to his people, both in the Old and New Testament, is often depicted in marital terms. The biblical writers frequently use marital terms to speak of God's relationship with his people and the salvation that he has prepared for his bride. For example, Isaiah 62, 5 says, For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This imagery then is carried over into the New Testament as Christ identifies himself as the bridegroom of the church. No wedding would be complete without a wedding feast, and it is no different with the marriage of Christ and the church. As the bride of Christ feasts on the salutary gifts of the Lord's Supper, she enjoys the foretaste of the eternal wedding feast to come. Drawing on this theme, the hymn that you heard, Soul, Adore Thyself with Gladness, urges the faithful to hasten as a bridegroom to meet him and with loving reverence greet him. She anticipates his coming in bread and wine of Holy Communion. Those who receive this sacrament worthily are those who have the wedding garment of faith in these words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. We begin this evening in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The end times of our salvation Christ in Christ is also depicted in the use of wedding imagery. It is likened to a wedding feast that a king gave his son. The Lord's Supper is a foretaste of this eternal wedding feast to which God calls his invited guests and offers them the grand feast of the divine gifts. In order to set the stage for the sermon, which is presents the Lord's Supper then as a wedding feast, it will be helpful to explore the biblical foundations of this wedding imagery. In the Bible, the first reading we have is from Isaiah 61.10 through 62.5. This reading was chosen in particular because of its strong emphasis on the Lord as the husband of Israel. We read, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks herself like a priest with the beautiful headdress, and as a bridegroom adores herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and the garden causes what is sown to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before the nations. For Zion spake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as the brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nation shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of our God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall God rejoice over you. Here ends our first reading. Our epistle lesson is written in Revelations 21, verses 1 through 4, where John brings us a glimpse of the glory of heaven. 
which human imagery cannot begin to capture. While living in the old heavens and the old earth, we cannot accept to fully comprehend that glory of heaven. However, we can spend these years preparing for that perfect eternal harmony with God that awaits us in the new heaven and the new earth, we read. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of the Lord is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. We now hear verse 1 of Soul, Adorn Thyself with Gladness. Soul, adorn thyself with gladness. Leave behind all gloom and sadness. Come into thy daylight splendor. There with joy thy praises rest. She was united with him in a covenant. Vows were made, and she broke the covenant by giving, her, giving herself to other gods. As a result, God sent judgment upon her in the form of invading nations, but promised to deliver her and show mercy to her at a future time. Our next reading is Isaiah 62, 4 and 5, which says, you shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your hand married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall God rejoice over you. God's relationship to Israel then is likened to that of a husband and wife. And an idea that is clearly given to us in Isaiah 54, verse 5, which reads, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. Sadly, Israel did not remain faithful to the Lord. By turning to other gods, the people of Israel essentially committed spiritual adultery and thus incurred the Lord's wrath. Isaiah then describes the consequences of her sin, but also proclaims God's mercy towards her. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I desired you, but with great compassion I will gather you. Another example of this wedding imagery is the prophecy about Hosea, who married Gomer, 
a woman known for her unfaithfulness. This was a living sermon about God's relationship to Israel. Hosea documents the beginning of the Lord's relationship to Israel, her idolatrous actions, and the Lord's merciful promise of restoration. The Lord declares, I will punish her for the feast days of Baals, when she burnt offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry, and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. But then comes the promise of a future restoration. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal, for I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall remember the name no more. When we turn to the New Testament, the wedding imagery is also applied to Christ, who, the incarnate, and the church, which is the new Israel. As in Matthew 9, 15, for example, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom. And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will feast. This imagery then anticipates the parable of the ten virgins, in which Christ is compared to the bridegroom, whose return is heralded with shouts, come out to meet him. The New Testament reading chosen then for these Lenten, this Lenten sermon continues a theme that is prevalent in the Old Testament. In the parable of the wedding feast, Jesus likens the kingdom of heaven to a king who prepares a wedding feast for his son. This banquet, as the sermon explains, refers to the end times of our salvation that God has prepared in and through his Son. It is the goal, then, of the church that presses on until Christ comes again and then gathers the wedding guests into his chamber. Our text and the Holy Gospel for tonight is written in Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. And while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. Then he said to the servant, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all those they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man with no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. There are three important themes that we can draw out of this parable. The first, the divine sonship of Jesus. The second, persistent rejection by Israel of the prophets. And the final one is the Gentiles of God's kingdom. You see, those that were invited represented the people of Israel. When they were called, they refused to come. In that same way, God's people rejected the prophets who called them to repentance. 
For example, in Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, we read, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. The consequences of these of this rejection then is depicted in verse 7 of the parable of Matthew. The king was angry. He sent his troops. He destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. This is likely to a reference of the destruction of the coming of Jerusalem. The end result then of their rejection of Christ is the destruction of their city and the inclusion of the Gentiles into the kingdom. Go therefore to the main roads. Invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. You see, in this parable, one gets a strong sense of the enormity of the banquet that is prepared and the great price tag that was attached to it. It was not just something that was thrown together at the last minute. It took great preparation. As it says in verse 4, again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. So you see, it is this eternal salvation God has prepared with his son. It cost God greatly the life of his son Jesus. It was long in preparation. It was finally completed with the suffering and death the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the word king, everything is ready, anticipates Jesus' words when he was crucified and said, it is finished. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, can you imagine a wedding without a wedding feast? The two seem to go together like hand and glove. And this is true in ancient times as it is today. Jewish weddings included feasts that celebrated. These celebrations then would go on for several days. There was no lack of eating and drinking. The marital imagery runs deep in scriptures. For over and over again, the relationship between God and his people is depicted in these terms. God is the husband and his people are his bride. Consider, for example, the reading of Isaiah tonight, where the Lord speaking through the prophet says, For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall God rejoice over you. Or consider the words of the Lord in Isaiah 54. For your maker is your husband, and the Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. And the God of the whole earth, he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit. Like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. It comes as no surprise, therefore, that when the people of Israel turned to other gods... Is, it was as though they committed adultery against God. It was spiritually unselfish in many places that the Lord likens the attachment to idols as lust or idolatry. This helps us to understand then what God means when he says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. His jealousy is the jealousy of a husband who expects his bride to forsake others and remain united to him alone. And it gives us a picture of just how serious of a sin it is to break the covenant that God has established between him and his people and that persistent rejection by Israel of God. Marital imagery, as we said, is not limited to the Old Testament. 
We see that in the New Testament as well. Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is his bride. Marriage itself is to be a reflection of Christ's relationship to the church. As Ephesians 5 reminds us, husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. And wives are to submit in everything to their husbands as the church submits to Christ. Not only is God's relationship with his people described in marital terms, salvation itself is likened to a wedding feast. As we heard in the parable tonight from Matthew verses 2 and 3, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. This parable reminds us that God has prepared a great banquet for those who believe and are baptized into Christ. To come to the wedding feast is to participate in the end time salvation of God, the salvation he has prepared for you at a great cost to himself. The price for this great banquet of salvation was none other than the blood of his dear son, who was offered up unto death for sinners on Calvary. As the betrothed bride of Christ, then, we look forward with longing eyes to the day when Christ will come again to gather us to himself. God's word teaches us to look forward to that day when we will sit at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and see our Lord face to face. Every wedding has its wedding feast, and it is no different with the marriage of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, his holy bride, the church. And the best part about this wedding feast is that we'll have no end. In the wedding hall of heaven, there will be no end to the joy that is ours in Christ Jesus. But you should not think of this wedding banquet to be something far off in the distant future. You should not think of this nuptial feast in terms of not yet. Already now, in the salutary gifts of the Lord's Supper, Christ gives us a foretaste of that eternal wedding feast to come. Already now, as Christ gathers at the Lord's table, we receive the body and blood of our crucified and risen husband, Jesus Christ. Stanza two of the communion hymn by John Franke derives the point home. Hasten as a bride to meet him, and with loving reverence greet him. For with words of life immortal, he is knocking at your portal. Open wide the gates before him, Say as you there adore him, grant, Lord, that I now receive you and that I never more will leave you. You hasten to that bride to meet him when you approach the altar with eager hearts. The words of the New Testament are truly words of life immortal, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. In faith, you open wide the gates of your heart to adore and receive him. And truly, he is with you always, even to the end of the age. In this blessed supper, then prepared for by the Lord himself, we Gentiles are now in God's kingdom. We truly participate in the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, where there is no end. As the communion liturgy confesses, since our Lord and husband Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, graciously invites us to this wedding feast, let there be no excuse made like those invited guests in the parable who refused to come, for such excuses are not pleasing to the Lord, nor are they fitting for those who are members of Christ's body. Let us instead be joyful and thankful, for the bridegroom has given us his body and his shed blood 
for you, his bride. And in your baptism, you receive the proper wedding garment of faith, with which makes us partakers of this joyful feast. You have been cleansed by the washing of water and the word. And Ephesians 5.26 tells us, In Christ you stand before the Father holy and blameless. And then in verse 27, Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. As we receive this marriage feast, may your hearts be gladdened in the presence of your heavenly bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we pray. As we proclaim the Lord's death for us, may we remember that by our eating and drinking, we, are, we also declare he died for me and that I may die to myself that I may offer him the living sacrifice of body and soul, that I may become a member of the kingdom in which we are priests. We celebrate with grateful hearts the miracle of ages, that the eternal God came down to earth and died on the cross for us, with angels and archangels, with all the redeemed saints in heaven, we come to the throne of the Lamb and sing, Worthy art thou, for thou wast slain, and by thy blood didst ransom men for God, and hast made them a kingdom and priests to our God. Amen. We continue then with verses 8 and 9 of Soul Adore Thyself with Gladness. Mercy driven. Lord, by love, my mercy driven, thou hast left thy throne. with the wedding garment of salvation and righteousness. Grant us, your beloved bride, loving reverence to greet you in the salutary gifts of the Lord's Supper, 
so that we may receive a foretaste of the eternal wedding feast to come, for you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.